today I'm going to tell you about the superficial fascia of the abdomen. So I believe you have gone through those previous lectures about the introduction of the abdomen and the cutaneous innovation of the skin of the abdomen that is like in the cross portion related to the dissection videos. And I told you about the surface features, the superficial bony landmarks and the transverse planes, the structures made in the different transverse planes and the vertical plane of the abdomen. Okay, now, now here I'm going to continue with the superficial fascia. Let me do the diagram first. This is the front of the abdomen, the anterior. You know, when we talk about we study anatomy actually, we study from superficial to deep. So, one thing we studied about the skin and the different modifications of the skin. Now, I'm going to tell you about the superficial fascia here. The superficial fascia of this abdomen, of course, it is very, and there is quite amount of variation in the predisposition of the fat in this abdomen, age related variations, uh, sexual variations. First, let me brief you about the layers of the abdomen. This section, what you're seeing is not through the median plane. Because if I, I would have been drawing it in the median section or the mid sedactyl section, they would have to show you some bilicus. And my purpose here is to show you the different layers of the entire number wall. If I draw it in a sagittal section, the mid sagittal section, because you know in the mid sagittal section you will not find all of the, of the layers because they are actually the ramification of the aponeurosis of the three muscles from the rectus sheath that's linea alba. Then if you go a little later to the linea alba, that is the para median plane, then I have to show the rectus abdominis. So, I'm not drawing this section to the median plane, neither it is paramedian plane. You consider this section to be drawn here in the plane of the mid clavicular line. So, if this is through the mid clavicular line, then I can show you the different layers here in the anterior down the wall. What of course is the skin, right? So, this is the skin, the superficial most thing. Below to the skin, let's say this will be the level of the umbilicus. So below to the skin, you have in the superficial fascia, right? So this is the superficial fascia. But below the level of the umbilicus, the superficial fascia is split into two layers: a superficial thick fatty layer. The superficial thick fatty layer is called this is superficial fascia and here below to this level of umbilicus let's say like imagine this is the plane of the umbilicus not the umbilicus because not, it's not in the median plane it's not a mid sagittal section but to tell you that this is the level this is the level of the umbilicus below to this level the superficial fascia is modified into two layers a superficial thick fatty layer and this is called fascia of camper and a deeper membranous layer of the superficial fascia is called fascia of scarpa c comes before s so remember this you should not confuse it later on C comes before S. So if you are like meeting the structures from superficial to deep, so remember that fascia of camper is superficial and fascia of scarpa is deep. So the membranous, this one is membranous. Fascia of scarpa is a membranous layer of the superficial fascia. Fascia of camper is a fatty layer. This one is a fatty layer. Then below to this, Superficial fascia, you will now find in the anterior layer down the wall, there will be those three muscles. Most superficial of them will be 
this one. Now this is external oblique abdominis. Then you have the next layer. The next muscle is internal oblique abdominis. And third muscle layer here is transversus abdominis. These muscles are extending throughout the abdomen. Below to this is the deep fascia of the abdomen. And this is called fascia transversalis. Although it's like a fascia surrounding the inside of the abdominal cavity from all the sides, it was lying to the diaphragm, it gets different names of it. This is subdiaphragmatic fascia, psoas fascia, thoracolumbar fascia, fascia iliaca. Then it continues down in the pelvis and form of pelvic fascia. So here this fascia lying in the transversalis abdominis from inside is fascia transversalis. Then deeper down is this cavity of the abdomen. Now this cavity is called the peritoneal cavity. So this is peritoneum. And what lies between fascia transversalis and peritoneum? This is extra peritoneal connective tissue. Same thing when it lies behind the peritoneum, then it is called retroperitoneal connective tissue. After knowing the different layers of the abdomen, one, two, three, four, five, six. There were six layers in the anterior abdominal wall or an anterior lateral abdominal wall. But now hold on at this point and think about what we have learned right from the general anatomy. The structures made in the section or when you prick, when you stab, the layer by layer, the structures that are met are the skin, then you have a superficial fascia, and then the deep fascia, and below the deep fascia is the muscles, vessels, bones, ligaments, tendons, organs. So that means these two, three layers are always fixed. That is the skin, superficial fascia, and the deep fascia. And whatever lies between the skin and the deep fascia is called subcutaneous, right? Or that's the content of superficial fascia. Now, this is against, this is going against the pattern, against the convention which we study throughout the body, that muscles lie below to the deep fascia. Here you have seen that the deep fascia of the abdomen lies behind to these muscles. Right? So what should we call these muscles? Shouldn't we call them as subcutaneous muscles? Because the muscles of the anterior little abdominal wall, they lie between the skin and the deep fascia. And that means this is a content of superficial fascia. But we are not calling it as subcutaneous muscles. Although, like remember in the face, in the face, these muscles of facial expressions, they are called subcutaneous. Because they extend from the bony facial skeleton and insert into the skin. So there is no deep fascia here on the face. Right? So these muscles of facial expression, they are called subcutaneous. The darkness, the muscle in the scrotum is also a subcutaneous muscle. Here in the palm, palmaris brevis, you must have heard of this, also is a subcutaneous muscle. So muscle which is present between the skin and the deep fascia is a subcutaneous muscle. But don't confuse with that erector pile. Erector pile, although we can, you know, we mentioned in the list of subcutaneous muscle, but actually it's an intradermal muscle. Need not to, you know, argue and debate over to this terminology. We should sometimes accept how the nature has designed our body. So remember that for that 
to follow that dimension, you should also think about why is this modifying it, the superficial fascia below the septum. So that's why remember, this whole thing is also going to reach down into the perineum also. So the deep fascia, that is fascia of scarpa, which is a membranous layer, which actually acts as a deep fascia in the anterior abdominal wall below to the level of the pulmonary right? Okay, so, but then if you start comparing this with the thorax, right? In the thorax, how will you compare that um, endothoracic fascia? Endothoracic fascia was the connective tissue between parietal pleura and the chest wall. So that you can compare with this extra peritoneal connective tissue, not with fascia narcissus, right? Both of them are, you can say the deep layer of this superficial fascia, that is fascia scarpa, that also is acting as a deep fascia. And fascia transversalis also is acting as a deep fascia. Now, the different layers you have seen. Now, I'll be telling you about uh, the continuation of this fascia, how this fascia extends beyond. So, this modification of this, you know, superficial fascia into camper and scarpia, this is going to extend laterally. So it merges with the superficial fascia of the back. It is going to merge with the superficial fascia of the antebellum wall above the level of umbilicus. It is also going to merge with the superficial fascia of the perineum, right? That is of some importance. I'm going to tell you about that. Now think about what's going to happen in this superficial fascia when it's going to extend down. It continues down here. Remember, like now, if, if you compare the continuation, one thing you have to think about: think about fascia data, that's the deep fascia the thigh. What is continuous on an anterior abdominal wall to the fascia data? Is this fascia transversalis or is this fascia of scarpa? So remember that fascia of scarpa has a limit. It extends although to the perineum, but what continues into the thigh is actually the continuation of the fascia transversalis. Remember the rectus sheath, the anterior layer of the rectus sheath is formed by fascia transversalis. The posterior wall of the rectus sheath is formed by the fascia iliaca. So that means the deep fascia actually is fascia transversalis, which continues down into the thighs in the form of fascia lata. Okay, now I will tell you how this superficial fascia continues down into the perineum. Both these layers, they will continue down into the perineum. But how will they continue? That we have to study. So remember that the superficial fascia that is a fatty layer that of course will continue down into the perineum but into the perineum this superficial fascia which covers the penis or the clitoris is devoid of fat but the same superficial fascia that is fascia of camper which continues into the perineum there, when it covers this scrotum or labium mages, it also develops subcutaneous muscles, smooth muscle fibers, and that is called tartus. Because this is not a continuous sheet of muscle, so that's why you also call it as tartus fascia. And this will continue into the scrotum or the labial pages. Now focus on what I'm going to tell you is about the continuation of fascia of scarpa into the perineum.
Okay, now look here. This is the superficial fascia. We are drawing it here in the dotted line so that we remember that we are talking about this transverse plane at the level of the lycus from where the superficial fascia was modified into a fatty layer, superficial fatty layer and deeper membranous. Then on the two sides it will merge and it will become continuous as a single sheet. On the two sides it will merge and become a single sheet on the sides that is flat. Now this fascia of scar when it descends down here you know we have this superficial inguinal ring opening. From here, what comes out? So here you see from superficial inguinal rings, the spermatic cord are descending down, which is suspending the testis. Now the extent of the superficial fascia it continues down here like this. It is attached to the pubic tubercle and from pubic tubercle it extends laterally both the sides and then merges with the deep fascia and here it's actually below the inguinal ligament it is partial lata. So this fascia of scarpa which blends which fuses with fascia lata of the thigh from the tubercle around 8 centimeters. Both the sides from the tubercle it extends 8 centimeter laterally and fuses with the underlying deep fascia of the thigh that is fascia lata. So this fusion of the fascia scarpa is called Holden's line. This is called Holden's line. Holden's line. I'll tell you its significance. Here there are muscle attached, you know. Remember, there is this origin of this muscle. This muscle is horse rider's muscle. When you abduct the thighs in the groin, find a tendon. And that's this muscle, horse riders muscle. So this is adductor longus. And from this lower margin of the ischiopedic ramus, this muscle that is arising is also called an anterior muscle. And this muscle is chrysalis. So this fascia of camper, it is attached here to the pubic tubercle, then to the body of pubis, and then it descends down along the ischiopubic ramus. It is fused, it is attached to the ischiopubic ramus and the body of pubis. It also blends with the fascia covering these muscles, adductor longus and gracilis. And here, you know, this is the pelvic outlet. Pelvic outlet. It's like this. Now, this is pelvic outlet. So, this pelvic outlet has various opening, urethral opening, vaginal opening in case of females, and an anal opening. So, this is. In the superficial uh, pouch, right, there is a membrane which separates the structures below as superficial perineal pouch and this membrane here, this membrane anteriorly, this membrane here is called the urogenital membrane, urogenital membrane and the posterior portion here, this membrane is actually called perianal membrane. This is perianal membrane. So this 
board that is the posterior board of the urogenital membrane. I am drawing it here so you can remember that this is the posterior board of the urogenital membrane, this thing here. So this fascia of scarpa, when it reaches down into the perineum, it also fuses with the posterior board of urogenital membrane. Both the sides it will be the same thing like this. Right? So that is the continuation I'm telling is about the fascia of scarpa and its attachment down below the pelvis. In the thigh, this is called the golden spine when the scarpa meets fascia lata, then the tubercle blends with the muscles and then blends with this lower margin of ischiopathical ramus and in the posterior part of this urogenital membrane. I'm rubbing this so that I can draw the other structures here. Now you consider this that there in the abdominal legs, this is umbilicus. Everything I have drawn, it's like this. I think it will be better if you see this diagram. This is what the extent of fascia of scarpa in the abdominal wall and in the pelvis. This is the shape. Right? So isn't it acting as a diaper? It acts as a diaper. I'll tell you its clinical significance, but more important is like remember there are two continuation still further. So this fascia scarpa and when it continues into the perineum, now the same thing is called Pulley's fascia. Remember that two words. Police fascia and coli fascia, or you can call it as fascia of coli. So, police fascia is there in the perineum, and coli fascia, or the fascia of coli, this is the deep fascia of the neck. Right? So, don't confuse with the spelling. You know, you are trained to raise your neck straight to keep your head high. With that, remember, I is something straight. So, I means for the neck. So, fascia coli is said to be the deep fascia of the neck. Now, similarly, there is one more confusion here for those who are not. Uh, strong in their spelling, learning the spelling. So, I'm telling you there is ilium also. Ilium and ilium. So, remember interon. Interon is you know, the word related to the GIP. So, this E, remember with this E, interon. So, ilium is a part of GIP, a part of small intestine. So, ilium is a part of thick bone. Now, look here again, we are coming here talking about fascia of scarpa, which continues as police fascia E. Now, this police fascia, you know, here it is this penis that arises from this portion in the perineum. So, obviously, this is going, this fascia of scarpa is also going to invest the penis or the clitoris. Now this continuation of fascia, I mean, you know, I am covering all this for the purpose of MCQs. So the extension of police fascia in the penis is called Bax fascia. This is called Bax fascia. Similarly, the, the, the one more extension and that is scrotum. Remember, if it's asked which scrotum is more lower down, which testis is more lower placed, it is the left testis. Anyway, so this continuation of police fascia in the scrotum, this will be called police fascia. So in the scrotum, you will get a different name. It's called police fascia here also. 
in the D partial of the scrotum is police partial. The D partial of the penis is box partial. D partial of perineum is police partial. And they are not actually D partial. I told you this terminology is like very confusing in the pelvis and below the umbilicus. So from here onwards, just remember that these are all continuation of the superficial partial of the anterior abdominal wall. That is the membranous layer of the anterior abdominal wall. The partial scarpa continues as police partial, which when covers this penis is called pus partial, and which continues in the scrotum is called police partial. Now at the same time, there was a fatty layer above that is partial of camper. So partial camper will also line the penis, right? So this fascia of camper which lies in the penis, now this will be called Dartus fascia. Dartus fascia and here also this is called Dartus fascia. So the continuation of this fascia of camper in the perineum becomes very thinned out and in the genital layer it is also devoid of fat. But in the scrotum, it develops muscle inside, and that's why it's called Dartus fascia. And the patient fascia of the penis also is Dartus fascia. I hope you understood the you know, this pattern of everything here. This is the sealing line, the line which is sealed to the adjoining. This is how the fascia of scarpa is sealed to the adjoining fascia. So it is actually like a diaper. And you know, it prevents now. Now, think about the critical point here. You know, that there will be here, it will be the urethra, right? So, urethra passes through this, and in case if there is a rupture of urethra here, so if urethra gets ruptured here, what will happen? Urine. Instead, if urethra, in like talking about the males, if you know this is a very common type of injury, if a person is walking on the street, his foot falls upon a cover what this main hole, and what happens is his foot goes inside, and that cover of the main hole that gets you know it straightens up and goes between thighs. So when a person falls, that the cover covering the man which uh, accidentally reaches between both the thighs and crushing the structures of the perineum. So there are chances of the rupture of urethra down into this perineum. So what will happen here that this urine will not pass out through the meatus. Rather that urine will start extravasating. So that urine will now start collecting here inside. Right? The urine will start collecting here inside. So, what is preventing? Let's imagine here, as I was telling here. If this urethra if this urethra ruptures here, right? So this urine will start coming out like this and will start collecting. It will even reach into the anterior abdominal wall like this. But as I told you that this marginal attachment of fascia of scarpa acts as a diaper so it doesn't allow the spread of urine down below to this thigh, in the front of thigh, because hold this line, the hold this line prevents the extravasated urine from the superficial connective tissues to reach into the thighs. Similarly, its attachment here, right, on the ischiopithic ramus prevents the spread of urine in the medial side of the thighs. And remember, here, here, you know, what I'm talking is, 
at these points at these points you have a potential space on the two sides of the in anal canal and this is called ischio anal fossa or ischio rectal fossa some people call it so ischio anal fossa so it prevents this attachment to the posterior margin of the urogenital membrane prevents the spread of extravasated urine to reach into the ischio anal fossa also so that means and you know what lies below to this urogenital membrane is called superficial perineal pouch so remember that this portion of the superficial portion of the anterior abdominal wall the membranous layer portion of scarpa is continuous with the superficial perineal pouch so the excavated urine will collect in the superficial perineal pouch but it will not spread to the thighs it will not spread deep down into the pelvis into the ischial fossa uh, let me tell you some few more modifications of this part of scarpa if this is umbilicus this is pubic symphysis right so let's presume that what i am drawing here is the male perineum so in the male perineum you know that there this will be the glands and the corpora spongiosa and here it will be the corpora cavernosa which is paired structure now this fascia of scarpa it descends down and as i already told you it will continue into the pelvis So now look here. This is fascia of scarpa. This is fascia of scarpa in the anterior abdominal wall, below the umbilicus. When it continues into the perineum, here in the penis, it is called Bach's fascia. And when the same thing continues in the scrotum and perineum, now this is called Colley's fascia. You know when this is suspended, the penis, the shaft of penis is suspended, but it has to have some support. For the support, this fascia scarpa, it, you know, it sends a loop surrounding to this root of the penis, and this continuation of the fascia scarpa in the root of penis. now this is important and this is called fundiform ligament this is called fundiform ligament and the same fascia as i already told you that it blends with the pubis it is attached to the body of pubis as well so when it reaches here to the pubis and here like this merges with this pubis here from pubis to the root of this penis there is also a fascia attached which pulls up the root of the pelvis and this is called suspensory ligament of pelvis so don't confuse now there are two ligaments separately fundiform ligament is a vertical sling like ligament which is a continuation of fascia of scarpa like a loop which holds and suspends the root of the pelvis that is fundiform ligament and that that modification of fascia scarpa which blends with this body of pubis and is attached to this root of the penis on its dorsal surface this is the suspensory ligament of pelvis both are modifications of fascia scarpa so today you got to know enough of new terminology regarding to the different uh, structures in the superficial fascia one was the fascia of scarpa the fascia of camper colis fascia pax fascia fundiform ligament and suspensory ligament and that the clinical point about extra position of this urine which is prevented by the margins of the attachment of this fascia of scarpa lastly you know it what lies between this 
membranous and uh, uh, fat fibrous fatty layer in this abdomen is all to be called the content of superficial fascia and that includes the cutaneous nerves, cutaneous vessels, lymphatics, right? Okay, so it's done.